Alistair is a long-standing friend of B2B Marketing, and he is is multi-ordering marketer. He's a host and a trainer of all of our, of a lot of our workshops. You probably, if you've been trained B2B Marketing on brand in the last couple and branding in digital, you probably um, uh, been trained by him. Um, and there's an awful lot here. And he, he's swapped soft tissues for software, and now he's inspiring to confidently grab the future with both hands. You know, he's he launched versions of Windows and Bill Gates, transformed leadership mindset within companies like GE, 3M, and the BBC. And now shares his unique authority with audiences around the world to inspire them, embracing the change with both uh, to change with both enthusiasm and hope. Um, and he's won lots of awards, and he's a lovely, lovely guy. I um, he's going to talk to us about. Alistair, what are you going to talk to us about today? I'm going to talk to you about um, change. Okay. About change well, and how we can all be a bit more resilient and fabulous. I hope. I'll see you in half an hour. In that case. That sounds good. I'll see you then. So thank you, uh, Joel, uh, for that yeah, very nice introduction. Yeah, as he sort of pointed out, it's almost like I, I wrote it myself. And it's one of those weird things you have to do as a keynote speaker. You have to write your own introductions. And I hate writing in the third person, but in the first person. But you know, in truth, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of weird stuff that's happened in recent months, haven't there? It's just been really surreal. I've barely left the house. Uh, my work shoes probably think I've died. And I've, I've just got these vague memories of a time before all of this when um, when I used to wash my hands just because I wanted to have clean hands. You know, long before it was it was trendy. You know, now everybody's on the bandwagon. Everyone's washing their hands. I've got I've lost my point of uniqueness. And I've also I also kind of miss I think I miss those days when not going out was my my middle aged entitlement rather than a diktat from central government. So there's a lot's changed and it's left me a little bit uh, discombobulated. But I think through all of that, I've changed and you've changed. And as a marketeer, change is a magical thing because it, it's, it's what allows us to move forward. And that's what I wanted to talk about today. So when we think about change, you know, are you good at change? Who here thinks they're good at change? You know, Pop a comment in the chat. I'll keep an eye on it as we go through. And there's this there's this saying um, that a leopard cannot change its spots. You may know that saying. And and to be fair, that's probably more about a person's character being difficult to change than than the, the, than their appearance. But but it's it's not really that true because actually I think we're all pretty good at change. And Lillian Hellman, the American uh, screenwriter, uh, she got it right. She said people change and forget to tell each other. People change and forget to tell each other. And that's a very profound comment at this stage in proceedings. But it's true. We're changing all the time as we go through our lives day to day, week to week. Nah, it's kind of imperceptible. Have we changed? But year to year, decade to decade, we change dramatically. And when you come to terms with that, you actually start to realize that we're more capable of changing than perhaps we give ourselves credit. You see, we're in this perpetual state of change, you know, where it's slow, insidious, imperceptible to a large extent. But the way we live, the things we do, the, 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 the ways we do them, they're all in a constant state of flux. I don't know about you, but yeah, I, I mean, I've just learned so much in the last few months that time has become this really weird concept. It's a very loose concept, doesn't it? Uh, March. March seemed to last about probably three years. Is that was that right? Did anybody else have a march that lasted three years? Uh, and then an April flew by in about two and a half minutes. And then here we are. And now, now I find myself just as today, by the way, um, having to come up with increasingly tenuous excuses for being late to online meetings because you can't blame the traffic, can you? you? You have to kind of think of some other excuse. And I, OK, I, I, full disclosure, I, I genuinely said this the other day to someone. I was late for my Microsoft Teams meeting with a client and um, I couldn't blame the train or the cars or whatever. So I, I said, I'm really sorry. The wheelie bins blew over and I had to go and pick them up. The wheelie bins. That's what it's got to in my life. Um, it was a windy day. Uh, not completely stupid. It was plausible, but um, that's what it's come to. But I think through all this, we just adapt and we just get on with things. And so if life becomes complicated, you know, if life becomes different, we're brilliant at adapting and moving on. So I actually think we're pretty good at that. What we're not we're less good at is liking change because most people don't like change uh, and we prefer the known the, the, the familiar the uh, the safe and that's just a survival instinct it's something that's baked into our dna long before we're even born we 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 have an instinct to survive that's what we're here to do and so we're wired to fear risks more than we are to love seizing opportunities you know from this little picture i've put on the screen 
Um, from an evolutionary perspective, it is, of course, much more life threatening to not spot the tiger, to not be aware of the danger of the tiger hiding in the bush than it is to say, go and pick the fruit from the bush. Because, you know, yeah, if you if you don't pick the fruit off the bush, you're going to be a little bit peckish. You're going to be a bit hungry. But if you miss the tiger, you, you know, it's B2B marketer rump steaks for that tiger's tea. So fear always beats opportunity. An abundance of caution. There's an expression we hear a lot at the moment. Through an abundance of caution, we're introducing these measures. And that saves lives. Well, great. But an abundance of caution also holds you back. And Elon Musk had a really nice way of putting this. He said that uh, you, you need to embrace change if the alternative is disaster. And I want to put it to you, to many of you, your businesses may be facing disaster. I don't want to be a doom monger. I don't want to sort of make out everything's worse than it really is. But the simple truth is coming out of the amount of disruption and chaos of the last few months, many businesses are facing a potentially catastrophic situation. So faced with the coronavirus threat, most of us as individuals, we've all changed. We turned our lives around on a sixpence. We did it brilliantly, even though we don't like change because it was thrust upon us. And now we face this dangerous moment where we go back into the world of work and maybe settle back into our cozy, safe, easy ways of doing things, expecting that the old normal will continue, and it may well not. So that's a great proof for me of my thesis that we're ready already. We're wired, hardwired to evolve and to adapt rapidly to changing circumstances. And you have the power to change almost anything in your life and your work. But you may not realize that, you may not feel comfortable accepting that on a daily basis, but you do. And whether you use that power or not is entirely your choice. The moment we realize we have the power to change, our reality is the moment that our reality can change. One of my favorite authors, Terry Pratchett, uh, now departed, he wrote that, uh, very presciently wrote that people don't like change, but make the change fast enough and you go from one type of normal to another. And that's exactly what we're talking about here because we don't like the change. We don't like lockdown. We don't like the fact that it's not business as usual. But if you make that change fast enough, you do go from one type of normal to another. And that's where we find ourselves today in normal version 2.0, whatever it is, the next normal, the way things are going to be for a while. Yeah, hit me up in the chat here. Uh, does anybody know who wrote this? Uh, who wrote this very famous statement? Very famous statement. It is not the most intellectual of the species that survives. It is not the strongest that survives, but the species that survives is the one that is able best to adapt and adjust to the changing environment in which it finds itself. Who wrote that? Anybody know? It's a very famous quote, often cited uh, in you know presentations like this, in, uh, in in books, in all sorts of places. Yeah, Darwin's coming through. I can see Darwin's mentioned a few times on the chat, and and maybe I've given you a bum steer, David. Yes, the picture is a clue. Sadly, it's not a clue. It's a misdirection. The person that wrote this quote was not Charles Darwin himself, but a professor of marketing an American professor uh, in uh, Louisiana State University who wrote this about Darwin. And I was a little bit clever because he actually started the quote with, according to Darwin's origin of the species, it is not the most intellectual and so on. And I find that fascinating that it's a marketeer who observed the need for adaptation, the need for change. Yet arguably, we are sometimes the worst people at doing it because we cling on to the past. I think you, me, all the marketers in this conference are ideally placed to seize the opportunity at the moment when the adaptation is most needed. So if adaptation is the key to survival, maybe we need to do some learnings and get some learnings from lockdown because the amount of change that people have gone through can be very informative for the amount of change we perhaps can bring to our organizations. What do we learn from lockdown? I learned lots of things. I learned that mandatory change, mandatory change is easy. If somebody says you can't leave your house, I'm okay with that. I stay at home. I don't leave the house. And it's very easy to do. I also learned that 
adaptation is very easy. So, you know, even without a roadmap, even without knowing exactly where I was going to get to, I quickly flipped into doing Zoom calls and keynote presentations like this and training workshops, uh, working from home all the time. I even I even tried cooking just 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 once. It wasn't didn't go well. But you know, I adapted. I got I got a got a hang of it. But I also learned that a lack of variety gets dull very quickly, doesn't it? Oh, it's so boring. It's like it's every groundhog day. Every day's the same. You know, as I grimaced my way through the 96th roll of little value toilet tissue. Uh, we still haven't run out, by the way. Is anybody any did anybody uh, run out of toilet tissue? I've yet to meet anyone who did. Um, but uh, I'm I'm going off track. Um, but yeah, I learned that the lack of variety gets kind of dull. Um, but I also learned that customers are very happy to be served in quite surprising ways. If we can make it work, we can do almost anything. My local pub started delivering beers, beer delivered to your home, fresh beer from the pump delivered to your home. Why, why did that not exist before? I'm asking myself. Sure, they wanted me to go to the pub to drink. But you know what? I'm thinking that maybe they missed a trick for years because they could have been delivering beer as well as selling it on premise. You see, if, if all of these things are true, then actually maybe what we need to do, if, if mandatory change is easy, why don't we mandate the change? Why don't we say this has to happen and demonstrate why it has to happen and make it happen? Because people will change. Your organization will change. Your budgets can change. Mandate the change because it's better to change early than late. You know, when you've no longer got a choice, that's a painful change to have to make. I've heard somebody saying here today um, that necessity is the mother of invention. That's a great expression. So create some necessity. If you haven't got a roadmap, create your own roadmap so that people can adapt towards it. Be the direction and navigate towards it. This is your opportunity. This is your moment to create the next normal, whatever that is. And if lack of variety gets dull quickly, then stop tolerating sameness. Stop tolerating the things that have always been the way they are. And there's no reason for that. Stop putting up with it. Be the agent of change. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, you can be the person who reinvents the next normal. I was, I was amazed. There was a barber, a barber shop here in the UK. Haircuts are very hard to come by, as you can probably tell. Um, uh, they're very hard to come by. And there was one enterprising barber who recognised this and started selling a thirty-minute one-to-one call with you at home, and they would talk you through how to cut your hair. That's amazing, isn't it? Fifteen pounds for half an hour with a barber, and they will teach you how to cut your hair. You still ended up looking terrible like me, but at least you had some support and you got to know that barber and they built business for the future. No one's going to be cutting their hair at home unless they have to. That's incredible. Now, why is it then that your business still insists on serving customers in a certain way, delivering things in a certain way, raising a purchase order like this? If it's not optimal, it can be evolved. It can change. And so I have a certain degree of, I think, fear as I look forward to the coming months. For B2B marketing in the near future, how will your brand compete for attention? Because many brands, in fact, I'll go so far as to say every brand is going to be competing for a share of ownership of a single singular cultural moment. That moment of we're back to business, business as usual, on we go, here's the new normal, all of that, blah, blah. And we're going to see loads of bland marketing about we missed you, we're here for you, all of this stuff. As you look to your immediate future for your brands, what do you see? Do you see a sea of sameness, same as everybody else? Or do you see an ocean of opportunity to differentiate, to, to be distinctive, to have ambition? To show that your brand has come back re-energized and from the rest and relaxation, it's come back a better thing and it's ready to be what it deserves to be. So maybe as we come to the close of Ignite 2020, you should ask yourself a very basic question. Is the exact same conversation happening elsewhere? And if it is, it's up to you to do something different, something better. It's up to you not to fall back into the old normal. So, so here's a few, just to wrap up, a few things that I think you should be thinking about. 
You're ready already. You're, you've got this, right? You, you've got the ability to change. You just have to find the energy to push it through, right? You proved that to yourself. What else can we do? Well, the first thing is that opportunity is close. The best opportunities for your business are not total reinvention. It's not something that's like mad, crazy, really stretching yourself. Because when we stretch and we try to push too far, things slow down. Stuff doesn't happen. The truth is the opportunities you need are very close at hand. They're like the pub that starts selling beer off premises. It's just changing small things that make a profound difference because they're possible and you can do them quickly. You know, the SOS, SOS is the, uh, the, the international distress signal, isn't it? SOS, save our souls, dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot. Well, SOS for me is actually more pertinently assigned to that shiny object syndrome. You've all heard of it. Some of you might have it. And I'm very fearful that there'll be many marketers who have attended the amazing sessions during this, this conference who are thinking about how do they stand out? How do they move forwards? And actually, they're coming up with, I need a virtual reality, augmented intellect, intelligence, three-dimensional Bitcoin printing machine. I don't know. They'll come up with some technological solution. They'll turn to the shiny object, the shiny new thing, rather than actually sticking to what they do. You don't need vast technology. I'm a technologist. I'm telling you, you don't need it. You need to do what is true for your customers. So also look where the opportunity is. Cull the inefficiency. You know, from lockdown, we've learned that you don't need to have back-to-back -back meetings. It doesn't work. It's impossible. You can be productive in new ways. So abandon those face-to-face -face meetings that don't make sense. Stop them. Do it. Kill those vanity projects like, Oh, God, the CEO's annual golf tournament. You know, that's, uh, oh, I see that so often. Uh, th those blah, blah social media posts about some industry award that you've won that nobody but you cares about. Start making something valuable. And there's been some amazing speakers over the last three days giving us some wonderful ideas about how you can be relevant, creative, and magical. And I'd go so far as to say your ambition right now to seize the opportunity should be to become famous, famous for what you do, not you as an individual, your brand, the thing you sell. Make it famous. Attain that celebrity status within your niche. That's an amazing place to be. And if you set yourself that challenge, I suspect you'll have bolder ambition than just changing the Pantone reference on the poster or whatever it is you might otherwise do. Because... For me, the gold standard of any content, there's lots of talk about content as well here, is that we need to create content that people will instinctively need to share. They'll want to share it with somebody they know. That you've, you've all had this. You see a post on social media or an ad or something, and, and you think, I've got to pass that on. I, oh, I've got to show that to Bob. I, I need to send that to my dad or whatever. It doesn't matter. But something that is so good, you cannot keep it to yourself. Ask yourself for your next piece of content, is it true to that mission? Is it so good that your target audience, not everyone, one, two, ten people, whatever you need, are going to look at it and go, whoa, I've got to tell someone about that. I love the Nike. I know it's a consumer brand, but they're just don't do it. Uh, creative work, just don't do it. It's a really bold thing to do. And you spent so many years saying just do it, just don't do it. Uh, aligned, of course, to the Black Lives Matter um, protests and the campaigning that's going on right now. Which brings me to my next point. The opportunity is close, so don't overstretch. The next point is that your your vision... Oh, my apologies. I'm, uh, I seem to be going backwards. We don't want to go backwards. We've got to go forwards. Vision defines your purpose. You need... There's a lot of talk about brand purpose, isn't there? You need to have a clear sense of purpose for your business. And all of the social disquiet that we've seen recently, Black Lives Matter, Pride, Me Too, Rebe Extinction Rebellion, whatever, all of that stuff. It's, and there's an expectation that society should stand up for what it believes in now. And brands selectively have a role to play as activists within their vision, within the field that they operate within. 
And I see this done so badly so often that brands will reach for some purpose and they'll say, oh, well, we, we believe in LGBT rights or something. They'll, they'll pick something and try to align themselves to it. And you think, well, that makes no sense. It's not a bad thing to align with, but it's just, but why you? Surely couldn't anybody do that? If they can, then maybe we could do a better job. And it's your vision for your sector, your industry, your the, the category in which you operate. That's what should define your purpose. So pursue a relevant cause, something that makes sense to you. You know, if you're a butcher, you should be lobbying for what you believe in. Maybe that's sustainable local meat sources. You should be the voice of reason telling everyone that that's what matters because it's aligned to your job as a meat provider and it makes sense to your customer base. If you're a Let's have a baker, butchers, bakers, and candlestick. If you're a baker, you should start protesting for, I don't know, zero additives or affordable meals for the elderly, something that makes sense. And if you are a candlestick maker, is anyone a candlestick maker? I'd, I've not met one recently. Um, but, you know, maybe you should be calling for the eradication of harmful blue light, you know, from technology in public spaces, in libraries, whatever, you know, something that makes sense. We care about your eyes and the light and the, the magic of candles. Look, they're daft examples because oof, I plucked them out of the air. Your brand purpose must come from your heart, the passion that makes you do what you do, and your mind. It's got to be logical to the purpose. Your staff should also be prepared to come with you on that journey, to stand on a cold, wet street in a February evening holding placards protesting for that thing. That's purpose. That's brand purpose when you're prepared to stand in the rain and say, we demand change. But it doesn't have to be outreach. It's just in your zone of relevance where you're currently operating. And my final advice is that if you have a, a vision, if you have a sense of purpose, you have an opportunity to rebuild your brands in the coming months, you have to embrace that with energy because change only succeeds when we embrace it fully. And 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 honestly, you, you've nothing to fear here except maybe mediocrity, right? Now, now that's about as bad as it gets. It's only marketing. Uh, unless you're doing it profoundly wrong, no one will die. You know, it's not like you're mining or anything. You're, you're marketing. You're making words and stuff, pixels. So just get over yourself. What is the worst that can happen? Nothing, really. There is nothing that's the worst that could happen. Now, if some of you are saying, oh, well, you know, if I do this, I could lose my job. I could, I could. Well, hello. If you are worried that you will lose your job by standing up for what is right for your brands, you are the problem. Not the business. You are the problem. It is your duty as a marketeer to do what is right for the brand and the customer. So stand up because fear is a ruthlessly efficient driver of terrible change. When we fear something, we'll perform all kinds of unnatural acts to avoid fear rather than delivering a change that we actually believe in. Don't let fear. Oh, this rhymes. Don't let fear stagnate your career. Hey, there's a logo, slogan for you. Somebody write that down. Copyright it immediately. So you get the point. And if you put those four things together, you'll have worked out that it spells Rove. Rove is my mission, if you like, to help businesses to, to have better marketing. You're ready already. Opportunity is close. Don't overstretch. Keep it simple, people. Focus on what you're good at. Your vision will define your purpose and your purpose must stand out and you must embrace all of this with energy and passion and a profound sense of doing the right thing for your customers. You see, I learned at Microsoft that you have to be able to thrive in ambiguity. You never have all the information you need. And change actually is remarkably easy to do when you come to terms with that. You don't have all the answers, but you have enough to, to move forwards and to make something change. And so Rove is your mindset to create your next normal. Rove is also a wonderful word because it kind of means to wander, to travel, travel constantly without a fixed destination. I think that would be the definition. And that's a pretty good place to be going. We don't know where the world will take us in the coming months and years. We don't know what the destination is. And to be fair with you, there is no destination. It just goes on and on. Our job is to be comfortable with that, to travel constantly without a fixed destination 
So go out there, be amazing, seize this opportunity to, to, to show the change that you're capable of. Be bold, be brilliant, be awesome. Thank you so much for joining us at Ignite. It's been my pleasure to talk to you today. Alistair, thank you very much indeed. A wonderful call to arms um, and, and, a, and, a great, and a, just a great way to close off three fabulous days. Um, I'm just I'm just to retract the thing I said at the, at the beginning. I'm going to ask Alistair a couple of questions and then we're going to dive off into a virtual pub. So get ready for that. But um, we'll try and keep questions coming in. We'll get them. We'll get to them. We'll get them. Take them later on. But Alistair, I mean, I, 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 was, I was kind of paraphrasing Sean Keebley on Six Music. Did you um, did you basically start with a lot of catchphrases and build a presentation around there or calls? Because you, you had it's so many great calls to arms and one liners in there. You know, I love so many of them. I mean, vision defines purpose and embracing the art of the possible, I think, was wonderful. That's, you know, that, that there's so much, so often in B2B marketing, we're, we're prepared to tell ourselves what we can't do rather than what we can do. Um, but, but you're kind of going, forget all that, the shackles are off, go and do it. Um, yeah. And uh, what, what's stopping you? Um, clearly, you think not a lot. Absolutely. You know, I look back on my career, I had 20 years in the corporate world, uh, 10 years at Kimberly Clark doing consumer stuff, and then 10 years at Microsoft doing business stuff. And, and a mixture of consumer as well. And if I look back on my career, I, the only thing I regret is not standing up for what I believed more sooner. I, I, I genuinely do. And I was fearful that I would lose my job. I was fearful that I would, you know, upset the apple cart. And actually, when I realized that, I, 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 in my last few years in the corporate world, I, I stopped giving a, I, I just, I stopped. And I said, look, I'm going to be who I am. And I added more value in those couple of years than I had in the previous 18 because I started being true to myself and I felt better for it. I still didn't get my way. I still didn't get everything that worked to work, but um, I, I started to feel proud of what I was doing. And I felt like actually I could, I could tell my grandchildren about this bit of my career because I, I wasn't a complete douchebag, but a lot of it I was. And, and so that's what, you know, and that's what I do now is I help all sorts of organizations to try and have that realization sooner to try and rescue more marketeers from mediocrity and just have a go. You can be amazing. You've got to believe in yourself. Okay. Believe, believe, in, believe in yourself and go forward. I mean, is there, is there a small negative in, in the, because one of the, in the brand sessions earlier, we we're talking about one of the questions is consistency, you know, from a brand perspective, you know, you change great, but you have to be deliver a message and be consistent about it. So I guess you've got to balance those things up. Is that fair? Yeah, consistency and also brand frameworks and stuff like that. I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with them. You need them because you need to define what the brand is so that, you know, if you go under a bus tomorrow, um, somebody else can come in and pick it up and continue the, the dream. But the reality is today you need brands that have got agility baked into them and there's enough fluidity and flexibility in the guidance that allows them to seize an opportunity, just, you know, like Nike did. Because if Nike had, you know, been true to its brand if it had a really locked down brand framework, it would still be procrastinating about what it should do about Black Lives Matter. It would have missed the opportunity. Yeah. And, and I see that excuse used so often in B2B particularly, is, oh, we can't do that. The brand can't go there and so on. And, and that's probably because you've got some archaic brand framework in place that was defined in a period when you could be rigid. You could yeah. be the same year in, year in, year in. Yeah. Uh, now you've got to, there's a new channel being born every five yeah. minutes. There's new. It's changing. Yeah, it feels like. I mean, I think you, you, you're kind of creating a lovely picture of a, of a kind of a graph with a you know a slow, a, a gradual acceleration. We just got to a point where it's just become vertical, basically <laughs> completely, completely vertical. So, um, yeah, I mean, just fantastic insights and things like that. And, I, and I, I'm the, the one last most important question that I've got to ask you is. Um, if you had one out of toilet paper, would you have admitted it to anybody? Because I know that I wouldn't have done. There would have been, you know, all kinds of negative associations about around I think, that. I think this could be true, actually. Uh, actually, uh, my wife was very sensible. We didn't actually go and uh, stockpile toilet tissue, uh, mostly because uh, it's only sort of 20 years since I left Kimberly Clark, but I had so much toilet roll <laughs> from staff sales. We still haven't run out. Uh, so, you know, if anybody, there'd be, it's on eBay. Uh, come on, queue up. <laughs> well, that's a lovely, a lovely, wonderful juncture to say, we're going to leave here now. We're going to go to into the breakout sessions. And in the breakout session, there is a, a an end of, I can't remember what it's called, but it's called something like a QA, and a end of, end of um, session drinks. Come along there. Drinks. Alison's going to be there. I'm going to be there. Unfortunately, I'm really sorry. Uh, Shane and Andy are going to be there. Um, uh, hopefully, David McGuire, lots of other people will be there. We'll have a chat. Come on stage, have a conversation, have a drink, whatever you choose. Um, we'd love to see you there. If you have to go now, 
Thank you so much for your time and for your customer these last three days. It has been amazing. I am exhausted. I'm a bit sweaty. You didn't want to know that, but but it's, it's generally the truth. Um, and, um, and, I'm, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to a life post-Ignite, which will be different um, uh, and, and amazing. So, but thank you for your time. I hope to see you very soon in the, um, in the, in the, in the breakout sessions in the virtual pub. Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone. Goodbye.